When there are high rates of HIV in your zip code, you are more at risk by definition. Incarceration, since there's more HIV in prison systems, when people come back to the community with poor services in place to help prevent it without knowing their own status, or more likely to intermingle in the same neighborhood that they left previously, come back with the same partners more, more than one often. And it's a perpetual cycle that doesn't do or bear well. And people often get sent back to prison uh, with the HIV that they may have acquired outside of prison because of the zip code that they went home to. It's a thing that we have to keep in our mind. Uh, and I think the last point, homophobia, I think is, is understood, but misperception of risk. I spent, I'm gonna spend a few moments on this one, even though I'm running close for time. So when I say misperception of risk, people say, I never thought to get tested because I don't do that. Well, I'm not a white gay man. Well, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have sex in that way. I don't do that, so I'm not a, that kind of person. I don't use drugs IV. Well, remember what I just said. Sometimes your zip code can actually be more of a risk than what kind of sex that you have. I have a couple of patients, women in their 60s, 50s, and 60s, tears, can't believe they're, they're positive, just got diagnosed. They said, well, you know, I had a husband for 20 years. He died, you know, and now I started dating again. You know, back in the day, you only used condoms if you didn't want to get pregnant. I can't get pregnant anymore. Never even occurred to me that I would be at risk. We had a, a woman about two years ago, 72 years old, already being seen in medicine clinic for many years getting sick, little things here and there, oh, she's getting old, right? Came into the hospital, she has a pneumonia. You, people get pneumonias when they're, they're 72. A pneumonia that wouldn't quite act right to the antibiotics that we usually use. What's going on? Turns out, 72-year-old woman, PCP. They're like, what? She's in medical care, she goes to Bellevue. This is, what happened? How did she get missed? Well, it turns out she's not alone. It turns out that oftentimes before a person gets diagnosed with HIV, they often present to the emergency room or even their own primary care doctor three to four times in the year previous before they get diagnosed. The doctor doesn't think about it, the patient doesn't think about it. Doesn't get to, don't ask me, I never thought of that. So the other interesting thing about the 72-year-old woman, when they found out she had PCP, tested her HIV, what happened, what was your risk factor? You know what the woman said? My husband died of HIV 10 years ago. No one ever asked me. Don't ask, don't tell. So this woman, we could have saved her immune system for over 10 years, right? She's 72, she's not having sex. A uh, professor in medical school told me, everyone lies, everyone's having sex. <laughs> Teenagers, addicts, people, everyone lies. Don't believe it, just test everybody. You know, let the test prove you wrong, but everyone's having sex until proven otherwise. Next few slides. I hit some of these uh, issues when we were talking about uh, networks, sexual networks. This is more on the zip code theme and who is having sex with who. Uh, a lot of uh, information came out of the study from DC that people knew that their partner had other partners. Their partner knew that they had other partners. Still never got tested. Next slide. We spoke a little bit about this already, incarceration in HIV. But uh, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, only about 2% of inmates are known to be HIV positive, oftentimes because Bellevue took care of all the inmates from Rikers in the inpatient ward. We actually had people tell us, you know, I've known I've been positive for years, I took my meds. When I got incarcerated, I actually didn't say that I was positive because I didn't want to be out, right? I didn't want to be put in a vulnerable place or to be housed in a certain area of the prison, and I just opted not to say anything and didn't take my medicines, and now here I am. All right, keep going. We talked about this, you know, people going back and forth from prison, high-risk areas, mixing up there with high percent, coming back and sharing, and, and back and forth. Next, next slide. So the next two minutes, I really just want to talk about, I think, what a lot of the panel will be speaking about. Really, what can we do to help change this? We can go through these quickly. So, next slide. So th thinking about how do we get those people, those 20 to 25 percent who actually don't know that they're positive. So, uh, HIV tests, I tell my medical students, now you gotta start young too. So the old doctors, I try. I try not to think of myself as an old doctor. But everyone gets an HIV test, right? 
I weigh everybody when they come and I check their blood pressure because I can, I can give them years of life if I put them on medicines that decrease their blood pressure, right? I know how much they weigh, they look all right to me, too fat, I know that, right? I check your blood sugar, I check how well your kidneys are working. Because I can do things that can help prolong your life and the quality of it. Same thing with HIV, HIV, you shouldn't be afraid to say it, I'm a doctor, my job is health. I'm not here to, to you know, to pass judgment or to, to do anything. My job is to take, have you be a, have a, you be a, your, my partner in taking care of your health, right? So I can't force you to take medicines. I'd like you to. I think it was if you were my brother. I do all kinds of things. But I can't force you. But at least when you know, then we can work with other issues. Uh, really, the misconceptions of risk, I think, is a big deal, especially with the women, right? And people who think that, you know, just not me. So when I tell people, I was like, actually, you are more likely to have HIV because you live in the Lower East Side than if you were an IV drug user in Denver, Colorado. Right, so, you know, take, take away what you think is right. I'm telling you what is, right, and what is now. And really, how can we and, um, pull in the justice system, right? Can we do better with corrections, or can we do some more intervention, simple things? You didn't want to know your status going in. I didn't force you. I offered you. Can I make you, you know, help you get know your status on your way out? Right? Because nobody's having sex in jail. That's okay. Right? But can I can I help get you to the right clinic or the right place when you leave? Can you know? Is it something I can't force you to do anything? But can I have something in place that would help stem the tide a little bit? So in 2010, I'm, I'm not sure about the updates. There are already printed updates, you know, with all this information with the criminal justice system. system. Uh, the Department of Aid Services here in New York actually uh, created what's called the Criminal Justice Initiative to try to tackle that. I haven't heard any updates or what their initiatives are, but I know that they exist. Next slide. So how can we do better when you know your status? What next? Next slide. So access to care, this is, I think this is something that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail. But once you know your diagnosis, you shouldn't be left swinging on a tree, right? Straight fruit, you shouldn't just be left dangling in the wind. We have to get you into the right things. What do you need help with? I'm here, so doctor, nurse, nutritionist, you know, insurance, all these other things. Mental health, mental health is a big issue. And you know, can we, can we do something? Can we have something in place? You know, there, there, were, there were campaigns to use condoms for years. How about a now what campaign? Now I know that I'm positive, what's the next step? How do you keep me in it? I think the importance of letting people know that you have to be in care. If you don't want to take medicines, that's okay. It actually helps even if you just come to my clinic appointments, period. Just talking, just knowing, right? Knowing your CD4 can't have what's falling if you're not on meds is actually a powerful tool, whether you take meds or not. Next. Oh, two more, just two more slides. Uh, retain, uh, keeping people in care. Next slide, you can go on down to the next slide. The slide previous really talked about how we can interrupt the issue of mental health. So I had to, to think about when I looked at the CASA, what do I see in patients who make it into their first two visits to me and then kind of fall off? What's kind of been the biggest thing that they've had in common? And, you know, there's always psychosocial issues. You know, I can't pay my rent right now, so this is the least of my concern. But one of the biggest factors has also been mental health issues, either undiagnosed or untreated, or people just don't know or admit it, or issues like that, right? Just the way we destigmatize HIV, we have to destigmatize all the other factors that really can foster into this. Uh, I think socioeconomic confounder, Bellevue, I had many a patient from Chinatown who said that like, you're a very nice doctor, you have the interpreter phone, I don't speak Mandarin, but how do I know I can trust you? I said, this is Bellevue. I don't, you don't need to give me your real name. I don't, this is Bellevue. They said, I don't know who you are. You're a very nice lady. You will never see me again. I'm not here legally, and I can't lose them. That's an issue. That's a big issue. OK, I, I, think, I think that was it. All right. Great, thank you. Boy, I could have said she could have had some of my time, but all I need to say is diddle. <laughs> um, 
So I'm so thankful to be here today because I think, as Janet mentioned in the beginning, that this is an important topic for us to start talking about how do we move people beyond um, certain points in the treatment cascade. And so it's great that as a part of tonight's dialogue, we can start to talk about how do we as community organizations, how do we as um, people who are working in different facets, some people are working in mental health substance use, housing programs, et cetera. So how can we move along? You can go to the next, to the first slide. So this is a care continuum for those people who aren't familiar. And it basically tells us what percent of people have been diagnosed. So of the people who are living with HIV, 82% have been diagnosed. Of that, we know that 66% link to care. So of those people who actually came back, received a positive diagnosis, 66% were linked to care. 37% are now retained in care. And retained in care, um, we've kind of even seen, it has different definitions. But when we think about retention in care, we really think about people who have had at least two medical visits in a 12-month period and at least one in a six-month period. Um, prescribed ART, so people who are on antiretrovirals, 33% of those who are linked to care, and 25% of those virally suppressed. I show this because on the next slide, when we talk about what does this mean for African Americans, this is where we start to see where some of those differences lie. 81% um, of African Americans have been, who are living with HIV have been diagnosed, and that's actually very similar to the general population, which was 82% on the previous slide. Um, you'll see versus those who are virally suppressed, 21% of African Americans compared to 25% of the general population, but compared to 30% of the white population. So we definitely see a decline in the number and the percent of African Americans who are reaching viral suppression. And one of the things that we want to be able to talk about is why is that? Why is it that we can't move people along the same? Why don't we see the same results? regardless of ethnicity when it comes to achieving viral suppression. Um, go on the next slide. One of the things that, that um, the doctor already talked about is social determinants. One of the biggest impacts that we tend to see around achieving viral suppression has been what are the social determinants that determine your access to health care? Oh, thank you. If what are the social determinants that determine access to health care? Um, it's a given that people, like she said, people take and access services in their communities, right? I'll use this as an example. We had a client who came in, diagnosed with cancer, has Medicaid. I have Oxford. I can't go to Memorial Sloan Kettering. She can. Wouldn't go because it was too far to go. Literally downtown train ride, right? But top doctors, we know at Memorial Sloan, top cancer doctors, it took her over a year before she finally would go for an appointment. Even though you have that access, not willing to leave the community, willing to go in my community, stay in my community, receive the services there instead of going and accessing what I'm, what I, you know, in some ways entitled to, what I have, a, what I have a right to. I can go to free, not even pay. Um, so, how do we get people over some of those issues? 